Alright, the conclusion. Apparently, somehow I hit the power button. I don't even know. But I have to... I'm just going to make this a part two. Okay, because I want to make this real easy uh, for anybody to, to see and understand. Alright, I'm going to lay out the end time for you. And to me, this is an important topic because, I mean, even the disciples, they came to Jesus privately and asked him, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And here in Mark, it says it's Peter, James, John, and Andrew. All right. And uh, again, here in verse 3, and the disciples came unto him privately. And then in Luke, of course, um, it says the same thing, right? And they asked him. All right, and what they're asking Jesus here privately is, "What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world?" I mean, isn't this the question that a lot of people are fascinated with? The end of the world. You hear about this uh, quite often, quite frequently, but it's astonishing that nobody knows what it's gonna be even though Jesus tells us as plainly as all can be it's incredible and I think the idea of fantasy land is more appealing to people than the the true reality that the end of the world is the end of the world all right and it's judgment day and it's going to be a matter of are you saved or are you not saved. It's that severe. All right, because if you're not saved, you got no more chances. That's it. As hard as that seems, that's the only fair way and the only just way to operate. And this is consistent all throughout the Bible. This is not just a one or two places sort of thing. The end of the world is the great day of the Lord. It's judgment day. The judgment is very simple. Are you saved? Are you not saved? Are, are you, uh, you know, think about it this way. Uh, do you have any sin? If you do, you're going to hell. You're going to be destroyed, cast off, cut off forever. The only way to have no sin is if Jesus is your representative if Jesus covers all your sin and he died to cover all your sin so now you don't have any sin blessed be um, blessed are those whom the Lord will not impute sin all right so you have no sin right now if you are saved therefore on judgment day when God looks at you he'll see no sin you'll be resurrected now that's important all right Jesus, when Jesus is asked this question, what shall be the sign of thy coming? He lays it all out. And of the end of the world, and this is the end of the world, starting in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall shall be shaken now remember that because this is a key signature if you will a key sign that it's the end time is up all right and we see this also in mark 13 where it says the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken we also see this in Luke 21 when it says when it says and there will <laughs> there shall be signs in the Sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. All right. Now think about this real quickly. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Why are their hearts failing them? It's because they know it's the end 
of the world. It's not a transition period. It's the end of the world. At this point, if you're not saved, you're destroyed forever. That's it, fellas. There's no second chances, no third chances, no fourth chances. There's no second resurrection. There's no third resurrection. There's no fourth, fifth, sixth resurrection. There's one resurrection. It's Jesus Christ, and then he has promised he will return and resurrect us with him. That's it. At this point, it's over. No more chances. It sounds hard, but that's the only just way for God to do things. And that's what he's told us all throughout the Bible. Now, keep in mind here, don't forget, you know, signs in the sun, moon, stars, um, the heaven, powers of the heaven shall be shaken. We're going to see the parallel in Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. It's the same moment in time. Okay, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They're gonna everybody's gonna mourn on the earth because they know it's the end of the world. It's not a transitional period, it's the end of the world. There are no more second chances to be saved. It's it. This is it right here. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power in great glory. Same thing in Mark 13. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. All right. And then also in Luke it says, And they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power in great glory. Now I want to go real quickly to Revelation 1, just in case, you know, just in case you had any doubts. All right. Be, verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Now this verse right here should hammer home any doubt, should hammer away any doubt, should pound away, get rid of, smash any doubts. Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus is Almighty God. All right, and there's only one God. There's only one God, and it's Jesus. Now let's go back again. The and the one that sits on the great white throne—that's Jesus. It's nobody else, right? And when it says, "I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God," that's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. All right, and so also let's go back here to verse 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Now this is key. The great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect, so those of us which are saved, from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Now it's also in Mark 13. And he shall send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Right? And then, of course, in Luke 21, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Alright, he's talking, obviously, to those of us that are saved. All right, make no mistake about it. And, okay, so, but we're going to get into that. Okay, because this gathering together of the elect, is, that's what we're all looking for, right? We're all looking forward to that. 
And of course, those of us that are saved, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. All right. You could think of all of our lives as a book, and then there's the Lamb's book of life. Once we're written in the Lamb's book of life, and um, we're saved forever. Okay. Our books are still being written right now, but once you are saved, you're always saved. Now, I want to point out something, I think, here in Revelation 1. If I can find it. Here, let me do it. Let me cheat, because I can't remember nothing. Right there, verse 6. Oh, I was right there. Okay, so verse 6 in Revelation 1, it says, And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want to point out this fact that we are kings and priests of God right now. Those of us that are saved. All right. So uh, if there's any doubt, and this goes uh, all the way back to the Old Testament, really. Other, the lineage goes right straight to Jesus Christ. Once we are in Jesus Christ, we are a priest of God. And 1 Peter 2, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are a royal priesthood right now. We are kings of Christ, priests of God right now. Okay? And therefore, when we go to... Uh, oops. Where am I at? So therefore, ooh, I wanted to go here. Or, or no, why? Okay. Forgive me. Forgive me. Okay. So I wanted to go here in verse 4, uh, where it says, um, or verse 6, excuse me, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. That's us right now. Right now, we are a royal priesthood. We are kings and priests of God right now. And shall reign with him. This is key. With him. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is clearly going on right now. Right? This is not a fantasy land period of time that's coming after the return of Jesus. Because when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. When it's the end of the world, all... The wickedness, evilness of the world will be done away with forever. Death is swallowed up in victory. Alright, so now let's go and take a ganders at, uh, see I, I mentioned this before, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 it says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump now remember that you remember hearing that word at the last trump so we'll go to first thessalonians uh, four excuse me <laughs> you'll notice here that it says in verse 16 and with the trump of god and the lord himself uh, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. All right, you notice that you making a, the connection there at the parallels. All right, connecting the dots here in Matthew 24, we see uh, says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. All right, that sound of a trumpet signifies the end of the world. Mark 13. And let's see. Is there any mention of a sound? Oh, maybe this one doesn't actually mention the sound of the trumpet. Okay. Um, that's all right. Because we know it's talking about the same thing, right? Luke 21. Let's see what it says. And there shouldn't be any doubt. It's talking about the same thing. Right, shouldn't be any doubt whatsoever. Okay, yeah, no, there's no actual mention of the trumpet here in Luke 21 either, but we know 
by reading Luke, uh, Matthew 24, it's the same thing. And in Matthew 24, it talks about a, the great sound of a trumpet. Right? So, that signifies the end of the world. And we can easily draw uh, a line or connect the dots from those verses to 1 Corinthians 15. Right? And then also 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, we know it's the same thing. All right, we connect, we're connecting the dots. This is also the same thing that we're reading here in Revelation 20, verse 11. Same thing. Now, let's go here uh, to Revelation 20, verse 8. We see another gathering, not of the elect, but of the unsaved. Okay? And this is at the end of the thousand years and at the end of the thousand years is when, is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and it is the end of the world and then Satan is uh, loosed and he is loosed for the purpose of gathering together the unsaved now this goes all the way back to Genesis 3 it's a fulfillment of prophecy okay now when this happens we are up in the air with the Lord all right there's one verse here that I wanted to also share all right so we're gonna hammer this point home we're up in the air with the Lord okay so it's the end of the world at this at the great sound of a trumpet all right we read this right here specifically three times we can connect the dots this is the end of the world the great sound of the trumpet and we are we are uh, changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye we are changed we are raised from corruptible to incorruptible all right first the dead in Christ then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air all right so when we are up in the air our enemy is gathered at our feet all right now let's work backwards here we'll start at Revelation 3 verse 9 I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee this is when we are up in the air and our enemy is gathered at our feet okay now we can go to Psalm 110 we see this echoed throughout but I'm just gonna use this one example the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool alright so this is when we are up in the air at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the saved shall be raised incorruptible right so we're up in the air our enemy is gathered at our feet and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all right until I make thine enemies thy footstool I will make them to come and worship before thy feet right so this is all we're connecting the dots through all these it's all talking about the same thing and of course this goes all the way back to Genesis 3 verse 15 where it says I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel now this is God talking to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman now it's interesting the woman is the one who gave birth to the man Christ Jesus now Jesus Christ had no physical father all right so the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ now we know by reading and studying the Bible that the promises of a of uh, everlasting life was made to Abraham and his seed right and we read in this, uh, Galatians chapter 3 
Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not, and his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are Abraham's seed. All right, oops. Now the the seed here, uh, her seed, is the seed of the woman, which the only person that's ever been born without a physical father is Jesus, the Christ. And so he's also referred to as the last Adam, which is interesting because the first Adam, from the first Adam, was made a woman. From the rib of Adam was made a woman, and then from the woman was made the Christ. Okay, now, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, the serpent's head, and the, the serpent's head will bruise his heel. Isn't that interesting? Talking about her seed, yet it says his heel. Of course, that's Christ. That's when we are up in the air with the Lord, and Jesus stomps his foot on the enemy and destroys it forever. Death is swallowed up in victory. There is no more death at this point. Once he destroys it, he destroys it forever. All right, it's very simple, very easy to understand stuff. I hope you get it. I hope I made it as plain as day, really, because you think about this. When Jesus has asked, what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? Who better to tell us than Jesus Christ himself? Nobody explains it more easily, more uh, simply than the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and so I hope I showed this and made this easy for you to connect the dots and to see that when Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. I mean, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? It's ridiculous. It's not complicated. It's not four and five different resurrections. There's not 22 different comings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming once. And it's at the end of the world. Okay, I think that's good enough for now. If you have any questions, please just ask. Let's have this conversation. It'll help me. It'll help you. It'll help everybody.